Well, we want to look, if you want to maybe get hold of your Bibles, we're looking at the book of James. And the book of James can be called a practical guide to Christian life and conduct. Or you could call it a guidebook for daily Christian living. Let's just have a prayer and just commit this to the Lord again. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, that your, your word is living uh, and your word is alive, Lord. And we thank you that your word speaks to us as we open our hearts, as we allow Lord, it to take root in our lives. So we pray you'd prepare the soil of our hearts, Heavenly Father, and pray, Heavenly Father, that you'd speak to us, Lord. Speak to us this, um, this morning and uh, help us as we look at this uh, book of James. Father, we commit this time to you. Pray that I might decrease, that you would increase, and that uh, the Lord Jesus will have all the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. John Wesley reluctantly uh, attended a meeting at Aldersgate in London, but that night uh, he was converted. And it's very interesting that it was while he was listening to Luther's preface to the letter of the Romans, as it was being read, uh, Wesley wrote in his journal, these are the words he said, he says, while he was, uh, he said, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, he said, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sin, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. And that was Wesley's testimony and Wesley's encounter with the book of Romans. Now the reformer Martin Luther, who had written that commentary that uh, Wesley was listening to, uh, he himself, he, uh, Luther was struck by the teaching in Romans that Justification by faith alone is entirely the work of God, which leads on firstly to uh, my point, and that's with the difficulties that we find with the book of James, because Martin Luther was against the book of James. He was against it as being part of the canon of Scripture, in other words, being included in, uh, in the Bible, one of the books in, that makes uh, the, the complete Bible. And Luther referred to it as an epistle of straw and destitute of evangelical character of an evangelical character because <clears throat> the heart of the reformation in Europe was justification by faith as opposed to justification by works and so he felt that uh, the book of James was inconsistent with Paul's message of justification by faith now even some scholars have gone as far to say that the apostles Paul and James are at loggerheads and contradict each other because James speaks of faith without works as being dead. And you'll see that in chapter 2, verse 14 to 20. And this is what has brought objections to the book of James. So there are those kind of difficulties that you will find if you read widely on the book of James. But as we go through it, uh, we will discover that far from the apostles being at loggerheads, they actually harmonize and complement each other. Now, one of my favorite objects to illustrate two biblical truths that are not the same, but complement each other, is a coin. It has two sides, but it's separated by a very thin wedge. And, and faith is, we can think of faith as one side of the coin, and works is the other side. Just as a coin has a head and a tail, you know, in salvation you have faith, and, and following from that are works. Two, two parts related to uh, one to uh, it's by faith it's it's by, by, by grace through faith we are saved but when we are saved there are there are works that follow salvation we're not saved by works says paul but with salvation comes works which is evidence we are saved says james so it's interesting that that the apostle paul himself he he, he makes this uh, he, he says this here in, in Philippians, uh, Philippians chapter 2. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to get there. In Philippians chapter 2 from uh, verse 12. He, he says this to the Philippians. He says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but much more in my absence. He says this here. He says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And then he says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So the Apostle Paul calls the Philippians to work out 
their own salvation. So Paul and James look at faith and they're looking at it from different angles. And so there we go. Uh, but the second thing as we overview this book is who is the James we have here who wrote this letter? We, we have the name James there in chapter 1, uh, verse 1. In chapter 1, verse 1, we, we, we see there it says, James, he starts, James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. That word James in the Hebrew could read Jacob, a very common name in the first century. But tradition affirms that the author of the books was James, James, the half-brother of Jesus. He's referred to there in uh, Mark. I'll just do a few, uh, Mark chapter uh, 6, just to show the internal evidence for uh, James, Mark chapter 6 and verse 3, he said, Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. So there we find this is the James that has been referred to. Well, if there was any, anything that, that hurt Jesus, even as we read there, it was that his brothers and his sisters who lived with him did not believe on him. And no doubt the same is true when you have brothers and sisters in Christ who don't really uh, believe in you. You know, James was one of them. But the amazing thing was him seeing Jesus risen from the dead. That was infallible proof of his supernaturalness. So if there's nothing else that will persuade you of the uniqueness of Jesus Christ, let his resurrection do it because Christianity hinges on an empty tomb. And after Jesus' crucifixion, James is supposed to have remained with his mother in Jerusalem. We, we, we told in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7, that after the resurrection, that Jesus and, and Paul, the apostle says, was seen by James and then all uh, the apostles. So this alludes to his conversion. We, we know he was saved because he was part of the group that gathered in the upper room there in Acts, and I'll, I'll just read that one there as well. Uh, Acts chapter 1, in Acts chapter 1, verse, verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And James was one of those brothers. Also after the apostle Paul, remember uh, Saul, as he was convert, converted, uh, he became Paul. And when he, after his conversion, he, he spent time in Arabia. And we told there in Galatians 1 verse 18 and 19, if I just can turn there, Galatians chapter 1 verse 18 and 19 there, we, 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 we notice what it says. It says, Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. And then he says, But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And it is here that he is definitely called the Lord's brother. Uh, Acts 12. We go back to Acts 12. Um, and uh, verse 17, we get to see something more about this James that is, uh, that is the author here. James, uh, we see there in Acts uh, chapter, it's Acts chapter 12 and verse 17. It says here, but motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison and he said, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another the place. And so we find that uh, James is, is, is a leader uh, there in the Jerusalem church. He's taking up uh, a, a role. He's actually on that Jerusalem council. And according to Galatians 2 uh, and verse 12, we read, For before certain men came from James... So there we, we, we see that, that, that James was a leader and um, was overseeing the church there. But sadly, he, like many of the apostles, we know that he, he died a, a martyr's death. And Eusebius, who is a was a historian and a most learned Christian of his day, he claimed that the Pharisees and the scribes, they took James to the pinnacle of the temple 
and they pushed him headlong and then stoned him to death. And the date given is A.D. 62. So this is the, the, the James, the, the Lord's brother. He, was, uh, uh, he came to faith, uh, most likely. And, 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 well, he came to faith after uh, Jesus' death on the cross, uh, the resurrection. He becomes a leader, one of the main leaders in the Jerusalem Council, the Jerusalem Church. But he died a martyr's death. So that answers the question, who wrote who was this James? But, but who, thirdly, did he write to? Who did he write to? Well, we are told there at the beginning of the, the letter, we, we told that James, a born servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. And then he says, my brethren. So James addresses 12 scribes scattered abroad. These were Jews who were scattered by the early persecution of the church and they went all over the face of the earth. But he's writing to a particular portion of these Jews, those who had come to accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah, as their Lord and their Savior. Now he himself was a Jewish Christian and he's addressing Jewish Christians. And his first concern are the believers among his own people. So who did he write to? He's writing to, to, to the Jews that are scattered, and, and it seems in particular he's addressing uh, all, but speaking this letter to the Jewish Christians. Where did he write from? Well, James wrote from Jerusalem, where he was the presiding elder of the Christian community. And undoubtedly, many Jewish Christians came to visit, especially during the feast days. And so James had this opportunity of just observing their behavior. He saw that their, their behavior fell far short of the standard that their profession of faith demanded. And so he decided to write a letter to them. And so the origin of this letter comes from a very personal observation. And that's why it's, it's so practical. James is observing. And, and, and it seems that this book was written somewhere between Stephen's martyrdom, which was AD 35, and the Apostles' Conference, the conference that is held there in Jerusalem in AD 52, which James was actually the chairman. And so he references this year to the scattered tribes, the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. That, that word scattered, diaspora, made up uh, of the word dear, through, and the noun spora means sowing. So, so th it's, it's like those who were like sown away, scattered as a result of great persecution in Jerusalem against Christians. And quite interestingly, it was Saul of Tarsus, uh, later become the Apostle Paul, who was the main instigator of this persecution. So this forced the Christians to leave their homes and, and they fled to, to other towns. And this is what the diaspora of the 12 tribes means. You know, likewise, Christians, to a certain extent, are a scattered family. At present, we, the, 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 the believers, the family of God, the children of the Lord are all scattered all over the place. But one day we will be brought together and what a glorious day that will be. And, and you'll find that James does refer to that day when the Lord will come and, and gather his, uh, the, the family of God. So here we find uh, united one day, we'll be united with saved loved ones, those that have gone before and also that great cloud of witnesses of Hebrews 11. So here we see uh, who he addressed. But notice fifthly, at what time did he write? Now, this was one of the earliest books that was written to the Jewish Christians in AD 45. And the letter is written to Christian believers who are scattered throughout the world because of the persecution for their faith, as I've mentioned already. Now, this suffering church was aware that life is very temporal. And they were conscious that there were strangers in foreign lands and cultures. And many of these who were scattered in the diaspora had lost everything everything they had in order to be faithful to Jesus. And uh, we, we can make out from the content of James' letter that many of these believers, they seem to have been believers that were young in their faith. And they just needed this practical instruction on how to live the Christian life. You know, they also were in need of counsel and encouragement. And so James responded with love and, and, and practical help. Now that, that is quite, all this is quite important in trying to understand how, why James uh, refers to what he refers to and says what he says and how God speaks to him and through him. Now note his first message to them is for them to rejoice in whatever state they are found. Because then verse 2 he says, My brethren, 
count it all joy when you fall into various trials. You see, their lives are guided not by accident, but by the hand of God. Notice there in verse 4, he says, But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, the reason patience can have its perfect work is because behind it there is one whose hand is there at work. And it's the hand of the Lord. So their lives are not just happening by accident. No, God is working in those circumstances. All things, if it was in the language of the Apostle Paul, all things work together for good. And so James says, count it all joy when you face all these various trials. So sixthly, what is his whole message about? Well, notice there in chapter 2, verse 26, he says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So faith without works cannot be called faith. Faith without works, he says, is dead. And so James wants his readers to know that faith must work. It must produce, it must be visible. Kind of James wants you to taste and to see that the Lord is good. I was uh, sent a book from, from a retired minister who's well known in Lancashire. And, and in the, this book he has little stories of his experiences which he calls small bites of Bible wisdom for daily nourishment. And a uh, really interesting book. And in one of uh, the talks he talks of, of preaching away, him and his wife, away and he was preaching. And he tells of how their host insisted that they have a piece of apple pie. Now, now this was no ordinary apple pie, seeing he had traveled 20 miles the day before. He went all the way to a bakery, which in his words, he says, make apple pies to die for. And so, I mean, uh, they, they accepted it. And you know what? They were not disappointed. The apple pie was so delicious. But you see, the point is that they only came to experience for themselves how delicious the pie was, the apple pie was, not by listening to this warm recommendation, but really by acting on it, by actually tasting it for themselves, acting on the invitation to experience for themselves, to taste and to see. And that's what the psalmist says, he says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You see, verbal faith is not enough. Mental faith is insufficient. Faith must not only be in our heads, it must be more and inspire action. So throughout his letter to these Jewish believers, James combines true faith and everyday practical experience. How is that faith working out in everyday life? practical experiences and he does this by stressing that true faith must show itself by the works of faith because genuine leather genuine faith is a faith that works and notice how he lists one by one the things that true genuine faith does notice there in verse 3 of of, of chapter 1 he, he says faith endures trials there knowing that the testing of your faith produces Patience. You see, because trials come and go, but a strong faith will face them head on and it develops endurance. So that's one of the things James is telling us, that true faith, it endures trials. But then, then verse 1, verse 12, he, he talks about a uh, faith that understands temptation. He said, blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So he says, true faith understands temptation. It will not allow us to, to consent to our loss and allow us to slide, uh, you know, into uh, uh, sin. Now, now, now we know that there are times when we sin, but he's talking here about where, where, where we're just susceptible to, to temptation time and time again. He says, but true faith understands, it overcomes. And he said, blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. 
And then he goes on to say that faith is visible by obedience. He says faith, this true faith, it obeys the word. It will not merely hear and not do. No, notice in chapter 1 verse, verse 25 to verse uh, 27, he actually uses the illustration of somebody who's looking in the mirror and forgets what they look like. He says, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. He says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, he goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. So he says, faith, genuine faith, produces doers. Then he goes on to say that faith harbors no prejudice. In chapter 2 from verses 1 to verse 4, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the flying clothes and say to him, You sit here in a good place. And say to the poor man, You stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And so he says, True faith harbors no prejudice. You see, for James, faith and favoritism cannot coexist. You see, James says faith is more than words. Faith is more than knowledge. It is demonstrated by obedience. And it overtly responds to the promise of God. So faith actually obeys. It, it, it responds to the promise of God. Chapter 2, verse 23, he uses Abraham as an example. He says, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. <laughs> and, and so here he says, you know, Abraham, uh, he, he, he proves his, his faith by, by his obedience. Here Abraham is asked to do, I mean, that is a, such a, a, a mammoth task, to take his son, his only son, and go and sacrifice him, Isaac. And you know, Abraham obeyed. He never sacrificed him, but he went as far as, as, as lifting up the knife. That's how he obeyed. And then he shows there in chapter 2, verse 25, another example of how true faith obeys. He speaks of Rahab, who herself was maybe just a, a young Christian. He says, likewise, he says, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? So here we see that James says faith, true faith, shows itself in obedience. And then he goes on to talk about how faith controls the tongue. This very small uh, part of the body, but very powerful part. And he says it must be kept in check. And he says faith can do it. In chapter 3 verse 1, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. He says, for we stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great. A forest, a little fire kindles, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. And then he talks of verse 8. He says, man, he says, for every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly Poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. So there we see the, the big challenge. And then he says, faith acts to control the tongue. Faith acts wisely. 
It gives us the ability to choose wisdom that is heavenly and shun wisdom that is earthly. Chapter 3, verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, willing to yield, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So he talks about how this genuine faith produces wisdom. And faith, he says, it contributes to our sanctification. It, it produces separation from the world and submission to God. And you notice as I bring it to a close, he, he also talks of how faith, uh, true faith assists in spiritual warfare. Chapter 4, verse 7 and verse 8. He says, therefore submit to God, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So it provides us with the ability to resist the devil and to humbly draw near to God. So true faith assists in spiritual warfare. And finally, true faith produces patience. And patience, here he speaks of how waiting patiently for the coming of the Lord. Chapter 5, verse 7 and 11. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. You see there verse 8, our Lord's return is at hand. You know, our Lord's return was a great source of hope to the early Christians. And likewise it should be to every born-again Christian, it's a living hope that one day we will behold our Savior, that one day Jesus will return. And you know, that hope, that living hope, should affect our way of living. It should be demonstrated by how we live our lives. And this is what James is conveying to these believers. Though they're going through all the hard times they're going through, but he's talking about this patience that this genuine faith produces. It affects how we live. And if it doesn't, then we cease to be New Testament Christians. This patient hope. I trust this morning you have this hope.